is Georgetown University Law School professor, friend of mine, Randy Barnett. Randy, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine, Mark, and I'm a big fan of yours. Well, thank you. Now, Randy, tell the audience, why do you believe we need to turn to this state convention process in the first place? Well, the Article 5 uh, convention process was put into the Constitution as a means of getting around Congress if Congress ever became the problem for which you need constitutional amendments. Because obviously, if the reason for a constitutional amendment is Congress, then Congress isn't going to propose them. You need some other route. And the, fa- the founders put into the Constitution the state, conven- the state initiated a convention, a route, in order to get around Congress. And all that the convention does, if two-thirds of the states uh, vote to have one, is it becomes like an alternate Congress. Congress has the power right now with supermajorities to propose amendments to the states, and then the states must ratify them. And what, a, what a, an amendments convention does, and as you know, it's properly called an amendments convention, not a constitutional convention, but what an amendments convention has the power to do is do exactly what Congress has the power to do today, and that is propose amendments to the states for ratification, and that's what we need. And we need it because the federal government is not what the framers intended, is it, Randy? No, the Constitution's been changed officially and unofficially, and the official changes have been almost as important as the unofficial ones. The unofficial ones are the expanded Congress, co- powers that Congress has claimed that this, and the courts have gone along with over the last 50 or 60 years. But the official ones are also important. In 1913, the progressives got two amendments into the Constitution, into the real Constitution, that really uh, altered the structure of our government. One was the, the 16th Amendment, which authorized an income tax that the Supreme Court had previously said was unconstitutional, uh, and that gave Congress enormous amounts of money to spend, which meant that um, uh, whether, you know, that the spending power, which form- before that was a relatively minor power, became a very major power, and as you know, most of what Congress does, it does pursuant to its spending power, if the income tax amendment gave, gave them all the money to spend, and then the 17th Amendment um, eliminated uh, the selection of senators by states, which was what the original design was, and made for popular election of senators, and that disconnected the federal government and the, and the, and the Congress in particular from the state governments that formerly had a role uh, in, in choosing the upper chamber. And so there's been structural changes to the Constitution already made officially and then unofficially by the courts, and, and what I think we need is amendments that are going to restore the way the Constitution originally was supposed to work. Now, I'm I'm asking you these questions rhetorically because I address them in my book and I've addressed them on the air, but you're you're a very serious man about these issues. You're 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 extremely you're a scholar. And so my question is, what do you say to people who say, "Well, you'll have a runaway uh, convention?" Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, it's it, it, all that a convention can do is propose amendments. Um, I do believe it's possible that the that states can limit the scope of these conventions by the way in which they authorize their representatives to uh, their delegates and how they authorize their delegates to behave while they're at the convention. Uh, but even if that weren't true, as you have pointed out on the air and as you point out in your book, um, uh, anything that comes out of a ratif- out of an amendments convention is simply a set of proposals. And then it's got to go. Those proposals must be ratified by three-quarters of the states, which is going to include a lot of red states and it's going to include a lot of blue states. So unless these amendments meet the requirements of the state legislatures in three-quarters of the states, they are never going to become part of the Constitution, no matter what a convention does. There's really no other alternative, is there, Randy Barnett? Well, uh, I do think that we've shown, it's been shown that we've, our recent experience has shown uh, that it's very, very difficult to change things radically or to change things uh, to the way they need to be changed um, uh, simply by electing more politicians. Um, it's not that you can't make any changes that way, and ultimately, as you know, this convention process is a long shot. There's no guarantee it's going to happen, and we're going to have to keep fighting on all fronts. But let's put it this way. This is one of the tools. This is one of the arsenals in our, uh, one of the tools in our arsenal, one of the weapons in our arsenal, and we shouldn't just leave it uh, laying there. When I, I got into this, Mark, about in 2010, um, when I got, uh, there were a lot of state legislatures that were passing so- state sovereignty resolutions and nullification resolutions, none of which would have had any legal effect, and reporters asked me uh, about those prop- proposals, and I said, look, if the states want to do something that is within their power, that were, that they, a power they were given by the founders in the Constitution itself, they can propose an amendment to Convention. And every time there's ever been, we've ever come close to having one of these, Mark, Congress then proposed the amendments themselves. 
That's one of the reasons why we have amendments to the Constitution that we've got, and that is that people have been working through the states, people get nervous about having a convention, and then Congress proposes the amendments themselves. And that's why we haven't had a convention, That's but we have to try for one in order to get the changes that we need to restore the Constitution. I feel, uh, Randy Barnett, uh, law professor at Georgetown University, I feel that the more oppressive the government gets, the bigger it gets, the more it interferes, and, and it's certainly that's the trajectory, and it's, and it's really uh, moving very quickly in that direction. Uh, more and more people are going to look for an escape route, don't you? Uh, I do, but you know, one of the things that we, you see electorally, um, and one of the reasons why the convention route stands some chance of success is that the composition of state legislatures, which are made up uh, by a diverse group of men and women citizens and uh, you know, legislators from around the country, is different than the composition of what we see in Washington, of the legislators we see in Washington in part, um, because... Um, you know, th- th- these states are not just dominated by the big uh, cities that are in them. And, you know, national politics gets gets warped by large metropolitan areas, and state politics uh, can reflect a lot more of the people that are th- spread throughout the country who listen to this program. Um, and as a result, that's one of the reasons why you see, um, you know, Republican state legislatures and Republican governors in these legislatures. And that's why we have a chance of getting amendments to the Constitution that is going to restore the original meaning of the Constitution. I believe I, I saw that we have 27 Republican legislatures right now. I mean, and this is without a concerted effort under Article 5. And you know, uh, Randy Barnett, the, the other thing is, um, when you look at these maps they always show of all these red areas, and then there's a relatively small number of blue areas, just to your point, and these are population uh, centers, uh, concentrated of population, the big cities and so forth, as you point out. Federalism addresses that, doesn't it? The diversity of the population, the diversity of the geography, the diversity of the states. Correct? It's it's the reason why we have the system that we've got. We do not have a system of unmitigated majoritarian democracy. In fact, that's what we kind of had state by state before the Constitution, and it proved to be disastrous because these majoritarian state legislatures, they started giving special privileges to the people who had the most votes, which is creditors as opposed to debtors as opposed to creditors, and they started erecting trade barriers. And the founders said, well, we got to get out of this mass democracy system, and democracy was considered a, a slur uh, back at that point. And we've got to get into a system of Republican government where the people are ultimately the check on the governors, uh, but we don't have majoritarian rule per se. Um, and that's the reason we have the system of government we have, and that's the reason why I think we have a fighting chance uh, to restore constitutional government in this country. I want to ask you a question. We don't have a lot of time left, but you are one of the preeminent experts on the Commerce Clause. And in writing this book, I studied almost everything you've ever written on the Commerce Clause. Absolutely brilliant. You're in the book as, as relates to the Commerce Clause. What do you say to liberals or even some Republicans who say, look, but for the modern interpretation of the Commerce Clause uh, by, by the executive and the bureaucracy, you know, we wouldn't have the FDA, we wouldn't have child labor laws, we wouldn't have this, we wouldn't have that. What, what, I mean, my, my attitude is, okay, great, um, if it was limited to that, maybe we wouldn't have a problem, but that's not really what the Commerce Clause does. What the Commerce Clause is open up everything to federal intervention. Well, I, the way they've been interpreted, absolutely. And, you know, by the way, my copy of the book is arriving tomorrow. Amazon's copy is delivering tomorrow, so I'll get to see... Um, uh, all Your own the, name and print. The, all the nice things you said about me. Um, yeah. Absolutely, Mark. And, look, one of the things that we hear, that I hear a lot, is that if it weren't for the Commerce Clause, we wouldn't have civil rights laws. But, in fact, there's, a, there's Section 5 of the 14th Amendment that specifically gives Congress the power to enforce civil rights. And if Congress were to use that power to enforce civil rights and that we're upheld under that power, it wouldn't be necessary to give Congress the power over all economic activity in the country just so they have the power to enforce civil rights. I think against the states. I think it is important for Congress to be able to enforce civil rights against the states because states were a big abuser of civil rights. That's why I approve of the 14th Amendment. Um, But it's not important to give Congress the power of the entire national economy just so that it has the power to enforce civil rights. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well, Randy Barnett, I really appreciate it. Uh, maybe from time to time I, uh, I will be inviting you on just because I enjoy talking to you, first of all. And uh, secondly, you, you really do know your... Uh, b- by the way, you're teaching at... Uh, what are you teaching this semester at Georgetown? I'm teaching constitutional...
constitutional uh, law two, which is our constitutional rights course in the fall and in the spring. I'm teaching contracts and my seminar, recent books on the Constitution. So uh, that, that's 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 my lineup this year, and my, I have a new edition of my book, Restoring the Lost Constitution, coming out at the end of this year. It's a book by Princeton Press. There's a new uh, updated edition coming out by the end of the year, Restoring the Lost Constitution. Beautiful. All right, Professor. God bless you, my friend. Thanks, Mark. Anytime you want me, I'm I'm here. All right. Take care of yourself.